show. I honestly don't think that this show could have been made even five years ago, possibly not even four years ago. Um, in order to get it made, you need CGI, you know, just, just visual effects to be at a point where visual effects can become part of the, the storytelling language of what you're doing. You need a way to put it out into the world. When I started writing the scripts in um, just after Terry died, which would have been like March, 20, April 2015, I began writing the scripts. Um, at that point, I'm writing it for the BBC. I was an episode in when it was profoundly obvious to me that what I was writing was so far outside the BBC's budget that um, <coughs> it, it, you know that it was unfilmable. And so I wrote pretty much the entire script, convinced it would never happen, but that I had to do it anyway for Terry. But that, but knowing that it would never happen, actually allowed me to write it, write the things that I knew we could never afford to film. And then. The BBC looked at the scripts and they went, these are the best scripts we've had in ages, we love this project, we can't make it, and they went out to Amazon and said, would you like to be partners? And Amazon said, we would like you to make it for us. And within a few weeks, and the BBC said, well, we can't do that because that's not how the law is and what the BBC charter is. And within a few weeks, the BBC charter had changed. BBC Studios, not because of me. I mean, it was it was pure magic and coincidence. It was good omens. Um, but the, the, the charter changed. BBC Studios <coughs> came into existence, and suddenly the BBC was able to make it for Amazon, which meant that Amazon was able to pay for it, which meant that suddenly. But even then, even yep. then, it wasn't. It wouldn't have been possible to make good omens the way we've made it two or three years ago because the CG that we're using just wasn't available to even this level of television you know with the budget we've got and even even then you know for us to actually have the Kraken have Atlantis have a uh, Tibetans and tunnels have etc 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 was it's, it's right on the edge of this budget to let us do everything that we wanted to do and, and, and get all the images and that was part of, part of the task and I, I think you know we've got it but but like I say a year or two ago with this even with the very healthy budget that we have it wouldn't have been possible. I don't think we could have done it. Could have done it. So the stories, it, it's like a lot of people say these days. You, you must hear, you guys must hear them saying, you know, the expanse that we now have of vision that you can have in television is like feature films from 30 years ago. We can now do the stuff, and, and doing stories like in science, in science fantasy, and science fiction, well, it's just suddenly possible. And, but then you also need to have, you know, my background is in Doctor Who and Sherlock and shows like that, which which is kind of a training ground for me to do good omens. When I read it, it was like it was. All those bits coming together, there, there had been a purpose in my life. Where I went, all right, I can. I, can, I remember the, almost the first thing I said to you was, "I think I can do this," yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and nobody else is probably doing this. Could you guys talk about the production design and what your involvement is or was? Our uh, production design was an through. amazing designer named Michael Rell, mm -hmm. um, and his wife Bronwyn was our prop spire. And, um, and we had amazing costume design and CGI design as well. It's a, it's a whole combination. We, we had just fantastic people looking out for how the thing looked. And always coming to me, always coming to Douglas, always listening to us, bless them, when we said, yeah, that's not quite it, or that's, that's nearly there. Um, but it's a sort of common thread, but, I think, which we've carried on into post-production, where um, I was starting to say to all the HUDs, you know that moment where you have in the middle of the night and you think, oh, that would be really great, and you wake up in the morning and go, oh, no, that's ridiculous, that's mad. I'm, I'm not going to even suggest that. That's, I, would, I would say to them, that's the idea that we want. We want the mad idea. We want to push it right to the edge, and we want, we want it to be... Were you, at the, were you at the thing this morning with the, with the, where the clips were shown? Yeah. That little moment as you're moving in on London to Soho, and the sign comes up on a suddenly frosted glass television screen with Soho... London and it turns around it says Thursday mm -hmm. that's the kind of idea that Peter Anderson are up who was going to do our the, the, the lettering and the signs and come said look I've got this mad idea I don't know if it'll work but maybe something could actually come up from inside the television and they're like oh let's see if it works Wait, what, what, what? and it does it makes it look strangely handmade any email that starts this is crazy but that's what we want and I, and I pointed them to 
um, the David Bowie song Aladdin Sen. There's a piano solo on that, that that's by a guy called Mike Garson. You go and listen to it, the piano solo is good omens. It just goes off and you just go, And you think, what the hell? That's not really possible to have that in a major song like this. And it's just crazy. Has it turned out so far exactly as you envisioned it? Or has no, it sort it of changed? No, it has its own life. Yeah. It, it completely became its own entity. At, um, at some point it started making itself. Yeah. And it starts taking over. It's, it's a bit like David and Michael. I don't have them here yet. But they sort of talk about how a third figure appeared almost between the two of them because they, they, they just started playing in the, in the show. And, and we felt that all along. So we've got amazing people like David Arnold doing music. We've got Peter Anderson doing our fun titles, plus all the graphics. And it just feels like a family just coming together going, oh no, this is the best thing that I ever want to be part of. This is great. You know, put, put the A-game plus on. I, I had a saying where if we lost somebody, you know, which we did in casting or something like that, we'd, we'd go from plan A to plan A. -A. So we just go up instead of we'd down. Go, we'd try and go for somebody better. There was a point where one of our cast, who was going to be great, um, had a family tragedy, and we lost him. And it was right at the end of shooting, which meant we had no money left to pay anybody because our casting budget had all gone out. And I thought, well, who do I want to play the US ambassador? And I sent a text to Nick Offerman and just said, would you like to come to South Africa and be in Good Omens? Yes, we can barely pay you. And he said, I will buy my plane ticket. To when, do I, when, when do I need to be there? And we did, and we did the same with the Globe Theatre. We discovered we could get into the Globe Theatre to do an amazing scene. And initially, it was the first week of Hamlet, and, and it was full of people, completely full. And we discovered we, couldn't, we didn't have enough money, so Neil came up with the plan AA, which is, it's the first week of Hamlet, and it's failing. <laughs> and there are eight people. I, I it's funnier, him, it's obviously. I said to Douglas, do you want a rehearsal then, or would you like it to be a flop? And he said, oh, a flop will be fun. Yeah, and yeah. I just wrote the scene with that uh, where Reese Shearsmith from the League of Gentlemen gets to play Shakespeare. And it's glorious. And a very nervous young man gets to play Hamlet. He does. <laughs> Appearing in front of two of the most famous Hamlets of their generation, looking up at him going, it's very good. <laughs> are there any lines from the book or script that stand out to you guys that happen to be your favorite? I'm, I love that we get to hear Francis McDormand saying the line about the, um, it may help to understand, you know, the, the triumphs and tragedies of human history to understand that they're caused not by people being basically good or basically evil, but by people being basically people. And it's, and, and you know, it says, it's said better in the book. Um, I love the lurking lines in the graveyard as well. They're still there. We, we, you'll, 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 every, every now and then there were just lines that we couldn't lose and sometimes they came back in the edit when we'd be going, oh, we need to get from here to here. And Douglas would say, well, it feels like we need something. And, no, and no, no, you would say that. And I would go, well, actually, in this book here, <laughs> there is a line that you wrote 30 years ago which might just fit this bit. Yeah. And very often it was there. We would go and pull it out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Cheers. Take care.